I am not a Catholic. May I give my reasons? The doctrines of papal infallibility, veneration of saints, and transubstantiation are all in direct contradiction of the Bible. We must test everything against the Bible. It says so in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Yeah, I find this just an absolutely fascinating objection. And uh, we can get to the questions of papal infallibility, the veneration of saints, and transubstantiation, and and I'll get to those in a minute. Mm -hmm. But much more interesting to me is the claim that we should test everything against the Bible, and that that is the teaching of 2 Timothy 3.16. That's really interesting to me. So I'd like to start with that. Let's start with the teaching of 2 Timothy 3.16. First of all, in 2 Timothy 3.16, the writer of the epistle tells Timothy that the scriptures that he has known from childhood are profitable for salvation, for teaching, training, rebuke, and uh, training in righteousness, so that the the, the man of God can be equipped for every good work. That's what what Paul says. Nothing in there about testing all doctrines against that standard to to begin with. But um, more interesting to me is these are the scriptures that Timothy knew from childhood. What scriptures did Timothy know from childhood? Clearly not 2 Timothy 3.16. That's right. Timothy did not grow up reading Paul's uh, <laughs> uh, second letter, right? Yeah. He, he grew up with, more, more than probably, uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, right? So that, that's clearly what t- 2 Timothy is referring to, that, right. that portion, that, can, that canonical Old Testament scripture. Um, which I might add includes seven books that the Catholic Church venerates that most Protestants do not, right? the deuterocanonical texts, which endorse, among other things, uh, the veneration of saints and the doctrine of purgatory, uh, you know, among many other doctrines. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so how are you going to get to your quotation of Second Timothy three sixteen? Like, if you're asserting this as scripture, well, this is scripture. I'm quoting the Bible. Well, how do you know that Second Timothy belongs in the Bible? I mean, I'm sure you're aware that most modern critical scholars do not believe that Paul wrote 2 Timothy. They don't, all right? So you, just the, the bare letter of the text isn't enough for you to assert its apostolic authority or its canonicity. How do you get to that claim? Jesus never mentioned 2 Timothy 3.16 or the book of 2 Timothy. Never mentioned it. No other apostle that we know of ever mentioned 2 Timothy. Arguably, Paul never mentioned 2 Timothy, if you think the critical scholars are right, and I would, you know, burden of proof to whether they are or not. Um, And Paul himself never mentioned 2 Timothy regarding, or the author of 2 Timothy, never suggested that 2 Timothy was somehow a rule of faith against which all doctrines should be tested. He was referring to the Septuagint of the Old Testament. So how do you arrive at the judgment that 2 Timothy is inspired scripture and canonical? I'll tell you how you arrive at that judgment. The sacred tradition of the Catholic Church declares that 2 Timothy is inspired scripture and canonical. That's how you get there. The reason 2 Timothy is in your Bible is Catholic tradition put it there. So if you reject Catholic tradition, then you really have no grounds for even citing 2 Timothy. Because we only know 2 Timothy through Catholic tradition. Right. But what does the Bible itself, what does Jesus himself actually say about this question? How do, against what standard do we test doctrine, practice, claims to what is true Christianity? Well, when Jesus made provision for handing on the Christian faith, he never mentioned anything about 2 Timothy. For that matter, he never mentioned anything about the complete canon of the Bible. What he said instead was to 11 guys, he said, go into all nations and make disciples and teach everything I've commanded you and I'll be with you to the end of the age. It's Matthew 28. Christ sent authorized individuals with a promise of divine assistance with the charge to teach his oral tradition, everything I've commanded you. Jesus didn't write anything down. It was oral tradition. I'll be with you to the end of the age. Whoever hears you, hears me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. Whoever sins, you forgive or forgiven. Whoever sins, you retain or retained. When we actually look to the teaching of Christ, the standard that he gave for determining Christian orthodoxy 
was sacred tradition and the teaching authority of the church. No mention of the New Testament canon of the Bible, which we can arrive at only after the fact through sacred tradition. Mm -hmm. So I think the principle that you suggest, that we have to test all doctrines against Scripture, is not itself a scriptural doctrine. Let's test that against Scripture. Does the Bible say test everything against the Bible? It does not. So it fails the test. But now let's go to your other question. Can we, in fact, derive transubstantiation, the veneration of saints, the infallibility of the church? Can we derive these things from the Bible? Now, I say we don't have to, because the Bible is not our rule of faith. But lo and behold, we can anyway. All right, we can meet the standard. Um, let's start with the infallibility of the church and the infallibility of the Pope. Well, Christ, we just said, Christ told the apostles, go into all nations and make disciples and teach. I'll be with you to the end of the age. That's a promise of divine assistance. Every place in Scripture we find that phrase, I will be with you. Like when God tells Moses, I will be with you. Moses says, hey, don't send me out there if you're not with me. Don't worry, Moses, I'm with you. Every place we find that phrase, it refers to a promise of divine assistance. For what purpose? Why was God assisting them in the proclamation of Christ's teaching? Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Whoever hears you hears me. The doctrine of infallibility is implicit in Jesus' promise to the church that he will accompany them in the teaching of the gospel. That's the way the thing is understood. Um, how about the Pope specifically? Thou art Peter. Upon this rock I'll build my church. I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What have you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What have you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Three metaphors. Peter is the rock foundation of the church's unity. He possesses the keys. That's a reference to Isaiah 22. This is an executive position. This is a prime ministerial position in the kingdom of God. What you open, no one can shut. What you shut, no one can open. Uh, and this power of binding and loosing, to, to admit, to exclude, to, to approve or disapprove. Right? That's, that's the power of St. Peter, which, according to sacred tradition, passes to his successors, the popes. Yeah. Um, what about the veneration of saints? Well, um, uh, take a look at 2 Kings chapter 13. That's, that's in the Hebrew canon of the Bible when the relics of the prophet Elisha bring a dead man back to life. Look at Acts chapter 19, when the third-class relics of the apostles heal the sick and raise the dead. Look at, uh, in the Deuterocanon, uh, 2 Maccabees chapter 15, when the prophet Jeremiah prays and intercedes on behalf of the church on earth. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, or Revelation 8, verse 3. Well, the saints and angels in heaven are shown to offer our prayers before the throne of God. Um, look at Romans chapter 13, where Paul says that we have to render to each one what is his due, honor to whom honor, custom to whom custom. And so the veneration of saints, if veneration just simply means to honor them, which is what it means, right? Well, we honor them for their holiness, for their overcoming lives. That's appropriate. That's mm -hmm. just that we should do so in the same way that I would even honor a sports hero for crying out loud you know he, <laughs> he won the heisman trophy that's honorable you know in his own domain we respect that we sure put up a trophy you know erect a statue a monument that's honoring um uh, how much more so uh, those who have uh, run the race and won the crown of life we should honor them yes recognize their accomplishments and that they pray and intercede and offer our prayers to god is deeply scriptural in addition to being quite traditional uh what was the third one we had oh transubstantiation Trans yeah, yeah yeah so um that Christ is truly present in the Blessed Sacrament, body, blood, soul, and divinity, Jesus himself teaches us in John chapter 6 when he says that my flesh is true food, my blood is real drink, and whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life. So the burden of proof is on the person who denies that Jesus said what he meant and meant what he said. 